know we've got um, a large group here today. Wanted to thank everybody and I hope you guys all had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday with family and friends. I uh, wanted to first thank Erica and Dr. Feldman for uh, your time today. Dr. Feldman, thank you so much for joining us, for all that you've done for the university and for diversity in, in, in and of itself um, in our communities. So uh, we wanted to thank you and I'm very excited to hear uh, the conversation today with Erica Parks, our president for the alumni group. Um, I know we're starting a few minutes late, but um, if there's anybody that's on for the alumni working group, oh, sorry, we did that for quite some time, the alumni board, that's our new board. If you guys just wanna uh, introduce yourself with your name and um, if you'll speak up, that would be great. Uh, and uh, we'll give you guys a few minutes to do that. So if you'll go off and mute and just uh, introduce yourself, that'd be wonderful. Hi, I'm Kim Metcalf. I am vice president of our new board and I am a environmental health science bachelor's and master's 93-96 and I'm excited to hear from Erica today. This is going to be our best one yet, I can tell already. Thanks, Kim. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Rina and I'm the deputy secretary on the alumni board. I graduated from UGA with the, with my bachelor's and master's um, and I'm really excited. I'm currently working as a public health advisor at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm excited to hear Erica speak today. Thanks again. Thanks, Samrina. Anybody else like to introduce themselves? If not, I will. I should have started with that actually with myself, but um, I know we've got some dead air. So Meredith Woodman, um, I graduated from uh, University of Georgia in 1996, and um, I am the executive secretary. Very proud to serve, um, serve our board here. And uh, again, wanted to welcome everyone today uh, for your time. Thank you so much. Looking forward to a wonderful conversation with Dr. Feldman, who's going to be moderating for us, as well as Erica Parks, who's going to be sharing her amazing journey. Uh, before we do that, I wanted to um, ask you, Dr. Feldman, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I know that we all have influences in our lives, um, both professional and um, personal that help to guide us, help mold us to who we are today and the choices we've made and why we got into public health. Wanted to see if you wouldn't mind um, sharing your journey and um, and then we can ask Erica what helped. Uh... Okay. Uh, professionally, uh... Really, the uh, the person that was my major advisor for my master's and PhD, Milo Gibaldi, was really a tremendous influence in terms of uh, teaching me about uh, research, uh, science, integrity, uh, and how to be a good colleague. And, and that was something that remained with me throughout what is about a 52-year academic career. Uh, he really was the influence that when I graduated uh, from Buffalo, uh, with a PhD, uh, my only interest was academia, and that's pretty much where, where I've been. On a personal level, uh, it, it probably is my wife. Uh, I, I started working at a pharmacy in the Bronx uh, in high school, and I worked there through pharmacy school. I worked there, continued to work when I graduated and got licensed, uh, got married, and I had been talking about going to back to graduate school, and really she was the one that convinced me to go back to Columbia and get a master's. And really that was the start of my, what, what's been my career. So uh, it really owe a lot to, to Renee for doing that. Uh, the other part uh, has to do with the 1960s, so, which is long before any of you. Uh, I mean, that, that was really, the, to me, the awakening of social injustice in America, uh, voting rights in the South, inequity in the country by zip code, uh, and later what that meant for health in terms of communities uh, of color and the poor. Um, one of the striking thing was when I was a, uh, we were graduate students in Buffalo uh, in 1967, we saw Martin Luther King uh, speak uh, at a meeting in Buffalo. That was about five months before he was assassinated. And that 
that talk stuck with me really for the rest of my life uh, in terms of uh, even with a bad cold, the energy and the important things that he said. And that really led me to, to really think about uh, anything and how I could help with, uh, with inequalities and uh, inequities. So that's kind of the short, the short version. Thank you so much, Dr. Feldman. And um, if we can maybe segue into asking the same question to uh, Ms. Erica Parks, and then I will let you, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you for moderation. Uh, we'd love to hear more of your stories. It's incredible, uh, your journey and all that you've done and um, contributed. So thank you so much. And um, Erica, would you mind being able to speak to your journey and your influences, both personal and professional as well? Thank you, Meredith. Good evening, everyone. My journey has been filled with a lot of mentors. So I'll start with early on personal. So first I would say it was Dr. King for one. As a little girl, I always liked watching every year Little Boy King. I look forward to that. I was always um, inspired by his speech, the way he could move people, the way he stood for non-justice, um, the, way he, the way he stood for justice, the way he stood for the people and, and everybody and how he wanted there to be a real community. Next, I would say would be my mom. I was the only child for a very long time. I'm the oldest and my sisters and I are nine and 11 years apart. And I also have a half brother that is nine years apart from me as well. And so during that time growing up, I often travel with my mom to her meetings. She was a chief union steward for the Teamsters. So if you're familiar with the Teamsters and everything they did for employee rights, I was always in those meetings, sitting there. And also I had the opportunity to be on the picket lines, holding up signs for employees' rights. So those were the groundbreaking points. To continue off that um, early on, I, was, I would definitely say it's my spirituality, my faith. So you're all about to learn something that many of you don't know about me. My mom was a foster child. And so my foster grandparents were founders of my childhood church. And so I have very deep spiritual roots. And during that time, that is when ministers ate dinner at your house. And so whatever programming was going on at my church, I was always there, the morning, the evening, you name it. And so those things have been core and my early development. When I think about my parents and how they helped to shape who I am today, my parents were very intentional in what I did, who I hung around, where I went to school. I never went to school in my zip code. If my parents didn't like that school, they would drive me to, to the school of, of their choice. And that's where I went. And so me joining the GROTC program in ninth grade was not something of my choice. It was my mom. <laughs> and truth be told, I told her today she enrolled me that I would never speak to her again. <laughs> Imagine that. And here I am, an army vet. My dad played a very important part in my upbringing because he always had me learning words out of the dictionary to give me spelling tests on Friday. So I didn't play a whole lot outside. My parents were very intentional. And so that kind of helped shape and direct me in the right path. As I moved on and started making my own decisions going to college, I had a lot of professors that were very instrumental, one being Dr. Demones, who really prepared me for the UGA experience because during that time, I didn't know of UGA and I am Atlanta, Atlanta native. I'm a first generation college student. And so going being an ROTC helped to excel me when I joined the military at 17. But being in college, my professor at a junior college, Atlanta Metropolitan State College, helped me to learn how to be confident, how to study, so that when I would have a Kennesaw State experience or a UGA experience, I would be able to thrive in those environments and be able to develop even more in my professional career path. When I got to Georgia, I met Dr. Corso. At that time, she was over the health policy and development department. And she played a very important part along with Dr. Gunn and, and making sure that I was always challenged. And so anytime I went for advisement with Dr. Corso, 
she would always change my schedule. She told me that you told me what you wanted to do, what your goals are, and those things you picked out are too easy. And so every time I thought I was changing my schedule and advancing myself, she would always, now Erica, you're not taking any of those. I'm going to advise you like I would my daughter. I've had so many mentors along the way. I could go on and on about that question, but those were ones that I really wanted to highlight uh, during this time to talk about how you know, I became the woman that I am today. Thank you so much, Erica. And Dr. Feldman, I will turn it over to you for the questions you're gonna be asking her for moderation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I guess, you know, the question would be is how you went from the studies, public health, uh, to starting a business. What, what led you to that? And, and I guess also what prepared you in all the previous life to, to be able to do that? I would definitely say my faith, my drive, upbringing, the military. But after graduating Georgia, being a first generation college student, first college graduate in my family, and so excited about going into the workforce, at that time, I dreamed of working for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I thought I had it all in the bag that I would get an opportunity there. And the reason why was because I've always worked for school. I've always been a full-time student and I work full-time in behavioral health. And so I just knew I wouldn't have any challenges. And on top of that, being a veteran, I felt like I had all the skills I needed because prior to getting my MPH, I was always told that once I got the degree, things will work out when well, they didn't. As soon as I graduated from Georgia, I experienced 38 months of chronic unemployment. It was a slap in the face. It was humbling. And during that time, I had to dig deep within Erica to really thrive and move beyond my circumstances and to wake up every day and to go after what I want, create my own opportunities, get out and intentionally network. You know, one of my mentors early on and, and when I was a student at KSU, taught me how to mentor, but I didn't really, I mean, taught me how to network, but I didn't really pay any attention like I did when I got out there and had to really learn how to navigate through the community. That is when I discovered the resources that are given to us when we leave the military in the little thick manual. They tell us if you have any, any issues, it's all, you know, all um, categorized into the reference to the services that you need. And so I thought that I would be able to get some help and there was no help for me. When I say there was no help for me, the services that I ran into were for veterans that needed a little more development. Well, I knew how to dress, I knew how to interview, I knew how to lead, I had had several different leadership roles and I had the education. And so when I realized how devastating that was, one of the things I used to always, you know, didn't like at the time that I would hear people say when I was serving, as a reservist is, you probably, probably heard the term, a weakened warrior, you have the best of both worlds. At that time, I found out why people said that. And I knew why other veterans would have a harder time transitioning. When I say other veterans, I'm talking about those that serve active duty because they didn't have the beauty of being a part-time service member and working full-time. When I realized those resources were lacking, when I realized those resources were not evaluated and a lot of them still are not evaluated, it gave me some ideas to do some things. And so Camouflage Me Not is not my first entrepreneurship journey, but after closing the gap on being chronically unemployed for 38 months, I finally landed a contract opportunity on the military base in Columbia, South Carolina at the United States Army Training Center in Fort Jackson. And I say that because 60% of those that have ever served went to basic training there. So as a dual mission, when I went to serve there as the health promotion officer leading their pilot public health project, that was one me. And there were 95 of us all over the world that facilitated this process for the commanding general for that base that you were assigned to. 
I had a chance to evaluate our transition programs. That was the first thing I wanted to do. I wanted to see what was different from when I left the military in 2004 up until 2015 when I was at doing the time on the base. And I realized a lot hadn't changed. So what I realized that would help with Camouflage Me Not is we need a process that facilitates us just like when you're a civilian coming into the military, you go through intense training for 10 weeks. There is nothing that mimics that when you exit. And so for Camouflage Me Not, I see it as an opportunity to do three things, to advocate and advocacy from a lobbying standpoint. So we are aspiring to become a 501c4. Research, real-time research, assessing longitudinal studies of veterans as they're coming out of the military. Annually, 200,000 service members leave the military every year. And 42 to 70% of us experience extreme transition stress from exiting the military to return back to the civilian sector. Erica, did, did, I guess going back to when you started and where we are today, are there any differences in terms of the climate, the needs, than from that original start to where we are in 2021? We have different programs and services that are popping up now. Like in Atlanta, we have the Vet Connect. I had a chance to work with Clayton County and standing up that in 2020 because Clayton County area lacked resources for veterans. So you have a lot of different community partners coming together to do something about the challenges that I discussed, but there still is more need. Thank you. In terms of addressing the more need, what do, you, what do you see as the things that are really necessary to sort of deal with the fact that there's huge gaps that, that exist today? Community would be the first one. I say community because we come from a very strong community. We are the largest fraternity sorority in the world, the force, the military. And we're so used to being so supportive of one another. We're so used to having the things that we need at our fingertips. So we don't have to go outside the base unless we choose to. There's the grocery store, there's class six if you want to have a happy hour, to network, there's the movies, et cetera. But when you leave the military, you have to find those things. And so a lot of us will leave the military and we may go back to our home of record where we left when we joined the military. Well, that has changed so much and just knowing how to navigate that. So helping veterans develop and showing them how to develop a community. I know we put a lot of emphasis in transferring our skills. That's great. But what I really think we need is someone to help us how to help us tell our story and show us how to brand and promote ourselves. We've experienced so much. We've had so many leadership roles. We had so many opportunities to work in develop new skills, but knowing how to promote and brand yourself when you're sitting down and meeting people and just getting out of your own comfort zone to navigate and connect with the community at large. That is a huge struggle. It, it seems to me, and this is just you know observation and reading, that in terms of the military and you know maybe nationwide, mental health is a really big issue. Uh, how in terms of dealing with the mental health part of the military, what, what kinds of resources are necessary uh, in terms of bringing the kind of help that seems to be needed? Well, we have the VA, of course, and that's where it first starts. Many file a claim there to get help with their mental health challenges. Uh, some of us don't go there. And I think a lot of that stress is enhanced by the different challenges we face. So I believe that we could utilize more support in that area, but mental health is something that America doesn't even address well. So it makes it even harder for a veteran to address. And most of the time when I'm in settings like this, that is the first issue that comes up in reference to us. 
Yes, we have experienced a lot. We have been in a lot of different environments. Post-traumatic stress disorder is something that you hear a lot in the media or see in research studies, but it's, it's also because of the extra challenges on top of that that intensifies it. So if we had those more supportive services to go along with the behavioral health services, I think we'll be better. And when I talk about having those, having more services, if we really assess them to see if they're meeting the needs of the service members, a lot of them are not assessed, which is one of the reasons why I started Camouflage Me Not. Back in 2017, there was a bill that was introduced to the house. It died on the vine. And that bill was to make sure that we evaluate all transition programs. We do not do that today in this country. We will forever have challenges if we're not really effectively looking at how that service member and their families are thriving or not post-military life, overall on a holistic perspective. That's, that's really important. What, how, what do you see that, or what you need from the public health community uh, to, support, to support the goals that you have? I've had a lot of help from the public health community, which has been a huge blessing. Camouflage Me Not has an annual signature event in September, Cocktails and Conversations, to get after some of the challenges that you and I are discussing. And so every year we aim to work with different public health professionals, different experts, therapists. We've had faith leaders to work with us. We've had community activists. We've uh, partnered with American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Georgia chapter. So we aim our initiatives around national public health initiatives, and we constantly get the word out through that. Through social media, we do a lot of content development, and we were doing a lot of road shows before the pandemic, which is just going in, providing them a, a presentation of our marketing, our marketing presentation I would give to those different public health organizations, faith leaders, et cetera, to let them know who we are, what we do, to let them see the needs of veterans so they can understand how to better service them if they're in the workforce, if they're their clients, our customers, family members, you name it. That's what we were doing before the pandemic. A lot of those road shows, we continue to do our cocktails and conversations and we turn some things virtual for Mental Health Awareness Month. We do a lot with promoting what we do on Mental Health America's website. They allow us to have that space to promote the things we're doing. I've also had an opportunity to work with my junior college, Atlanta Metropolitan State College, to, to help the South, to help, to help Southwest Atlanta understand some of the challenges that veterans face because they have a veteran population there at my junior college. That's terrific. Uh, I guess the, the last question really has to be, um, down the road, where do you see yourself? What do you see yourself doing five years from now? Five years from now, I want us to have a brick and mortar, <laughs> full staff. We have a lot of volunteers, contracts for different projects. I want to be able to turn those into full-time opportunities. I want us to be doing some, some serious lobbying and some testimonials in front of testifying before Congress about what we're seeing in real time to help them develop and shape policy better, which is why we do not want to be in the 501c3 space. We want to be at the table shaping these policies that come down to 501c3s for them to develop effective program that is needed. Great. Have you identified any, I guess, key congressional people that, uh, are listening to you and you providing access in terms of the legislative process? Prior to, I, I had a chance to go to Congressman Lewis' office and meet with his staff. Camouflage Me Not has also been to the Atlanta Commission of Veterans Affairs. Many folks don't know every major city has a commission for veterans. And so it, here is ran through Atlanta City Council. It falls up under the Atlanta mayor. So those are the, the avenues that we have had in making connections thus far. That's terrific. Make, make sure you send me information on how I can help. 
I sure will. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. All right. I've, I've, why, why don't we turn it over to others who may have comments or questions as well? So I saw in the chat that we had um, Lanisha. Lanisha, do you want to speak to what you mentioned? In the I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your Are question. You Lanisha, you should probably just ask the question, maybe. I, I didn't have a question to ask, but I can't even hear what she's saying, so. Gotcha. <laughs> then, Erica, I'll ask my question. <laughs> this is Adam. I just made, oh, she wanted me to elaborate on my comment. Um, where my comment is when Erica mentioned about mental health and VA hospitals and the little the the C box, which are the smaller offices. A lot of veterans don't like going to the VA to talk about mental health stuff because if you think about it, the majority of the mental health providers are not veterans. And so that person cannot identify with what a veteran is, you know, what they really are experiencing or what's going on inside of their head as, as opposed to a civilian. And so a lot of veterans feel like, you know, because these providers can't, you know, really grasp and understand what they're really going through, they just, all, they feel like a lot of medications are just thrown at them to, you know, pretty much keep them sedated or in a vegetative state. Like, I guess these medications will help them to just forget, but they don't forget that stuff is, is, is um, you know, that's in them every morning, every afternoon, every night. And I know this firsthand because I've, you know, I've seen it out there at, you know, at the VA. I have several friends who are veterans and my husband is one. And I've been out there talking, you know, with their mental health people. So I understand, you know, how it is, you know, that they feel like that. It's like, you know, pretty much, you know, where, where can they go to where they can really feel comfortable, where there's somebody who can really understand um, what they're going through. And I know one of the ways that they do this, they kind of have to have groups where other veterans are there who can identify but of course with COVID going on you know they've had to back off those group sessions so you know that so that's pretty much what my um my comment was about with mental health and veterans I totally agree thanks. oh go ahead no, no, I was going to say just thanks for Lenisha sharing that and, and go ahead with your response, Erica. Thanks so much. So I totally agree, which is why a lot of our framework and our community activities that we provide, we have developed a list, a great list of providers that will talk to our veterans that have sliding fee scales. And which is why our Cocktails and Conversations event looks the way it does. The framework is set up where we take over the airway for September. We have even been on the radio station. We have done public service announcements. We have been able to have a talk similar to this on the radio about our challenges. And so during that month, our facilitators, the five that we have and they're different every year, I provide them an opportunity based upon their expertise to have a talk, an interactive talk that looks like this. And we do it on Facebook, because that's where our, mainly our community is for Camouflage Me Not. So it's a live, so people can ask questions. And then at Cocktails and Conversations, they have those small intimate spaces with discussions that they're having. And we, we label them with catchy phrases. And so 
the veteran or the non-veteran, they go to the table of choice, the one that draws them. For example, we've had unappreciated, we've had frequent crying spells, we've had military family matters. So those, are just, those are some of the names that we will put on those tables at the event to get people talking, to learn new coping skills, to be able to, and to express themselves and to also develop and build some new relationships that they may need down the road. And we also have you know, business owners that provide resources for them as well. And so we are always providing information in that way simply because of what you just said, Lanisha. I'm a veteran. I go to the VA to stay connected, but that's not where I get my health care mainly. I go really to stay in the know so I can raise sand. <laughs> just being honest. And Erica, we've got a few other questions. I've got one on chat. We'll get to that in just a second from Kim. Thank you so much. Wanted to ask you um, from, from your perspective, what do you believe is the top public health concern facing our nation today? And some, some thoughts around that from you. Uh, of, of course, I would say the pandemic. And you probably say, we talk about that all the time. Well, I say the pandemic, and I'm going to peel it back a little bit. I think that a lot of us are going to struggle from social isolation. I think a lot of us may experience post-traumatic stress disorder. I think a lot of us are going to have some challenges because we're having delayed responses, meaning we're not processing things. And so I'm glad you asked this question, because when people talk about the pandemic and camouflage me not had to shift pivot what we were doing when the pandemic happened. So the first year in the pandemic, a, a month or so shy in it, we had mobilizing your faith in April. And I had a retired military chaplain to come and talk to the group overall about how the pandemic remind us of a deployment. Those of us that serve, wearing a mask, being told what to do, instructions changing all the time. That's what we experience as so, so service members when we are deployed. And so just like we have a delayed response, we veterans, when we're downrange, that's what we call being deployed out of the United States, things that are going on at home are back in the rear. When we get home, we're trying to deal with it. Everybody else around us has dealt with it. I think we're gonna experience that same thing as civilians from this pandemic. How many times do you open your social media and hear or see rest in peace? Someone has passed. No one is really able to process or maybe grieve like they normally would because we're in a pandemic. We're trying to be safe. We can't travel like we, we normally would. So I think this pandemic is a major threat in how we communicate. We're not able to have as many interactions or the interactions like we would like to have them all the time. And that's going to play a big part in us being able to cope, us being able to, to do a lot of the work that we do our, our desire to do. And I think the faith community is really going to see it really hard when it comes to this pandemic, because if you haven't been talking about issues like what we're talking about right now that are considered taboo or stigmatizing, mental health is going to show up in the preachers, the Catholic minister, the Catholic leader, all of those, those laps. They're, it's going to show up then. They're going to have to address it and deal with it. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, Kim, I know you had a, a question um, that you posted on our chat on Zoom. Do you want to ask your question to Erica, please? Absolutely. So Erica, just hearing your journey, and I feel like, you know, we've gotten to know each other over the last year through this working group, but Oh my gosh, I'm learning so much. And you're inspirational the way you were able to just be tenacious, being in and out of, of you know, employment and unemployment over that time period. So I think our graduates are facing interesting, challenging times coming up with the job market being the way it is. So what can we as the College of Public Health do to help these students to navigate this crazy challenging job market that I'm sure they're experiencing? I believe our mentoring program is one that we must utilize to the max. I'm pending approval. And when I was going through that process, I was, I was very impressed because I've been through the process before one of my, another one of my alum, alumni. And 
UGA's process to help students connect to mentors priceless. I was so happy to see them ask me about foster care homelessness and to check yes. No, I've never been homeless, but I do have the foster care experience as I talked about earlier. I think this is the best time for us as alums to be vulnerable, to not just tell the students the good stuff, prepare them for the challenges ahead. We tell people, we tell our kids to go to school, get a good education so they can get what? That good job. What if it doesn't come? And you never talk to them about the obstacles up the road. Now you are preparing them for failure because you didn't prepare them to plan by sharing your lessons learned from your journey. I also believe in that, that we set them up for failure by making them think there's something they didn't do or should be doing or it's their fault that they find themselves underemployed or unemployed. No, we need to mentor them. We need to connect with them. They don't quite understand right off why you are reaching out or touching them like you do life. Mentor several uh, students in and outside of Georgia. And I noticed one thing overall in all of those mentorship relationships it's only after they graduate, they realize, oh, this is why Erica kept checking up on me. She would call an exam sign when she would send a care package or she would do this. It doesn't click to later. So the more we can do that now to prepare them, being our guests, speakers in the seminar program that we have at Georgia, we need to take advantage of all of that. We need to provide those students with anything that we, the individual, when you're mentoring, anything you wish you would have had when you were a student, be that for our students. Thank you so much, Erica. We've got a lot of love uh, in the chat for you. Kim, amen, mentoring program is crucial, uh, Reagan, Excellent, Erica. Amen. I didn't get a job in my field right away. That's from Lanisha. I think it's so important for us to share that. Um, as you stated, we by preparing them for potential obstacles, they'll know that that's part of the journey. And that's really not something that's that's often discussed. So I, I vote for you to write a book. Has that been something ever that you've ever thought about doing? I know that wasn't part of one of our questions, but just in hearing you talk, you're just such a motivational speaker uh, and inspire me daily, to be honest with you. Thank you. Uh, I'm laughing because I do have some chapters outlined, a process I started before I left Fort Jackson, and it's taking time. Um, being more vulnerable and getting more uncomfortable is what I challenge myself with doing. Uh, people see me and they think, oh, Erica, then she's doing this, she's doing that. They have no idea the daily challenges and motivating myself and staying on my knees, praying and seeking God for direction. I used to wouldn't speak out about that, but it's so important that um, people understand that's why Erica's who she is. She, she stays close to her faith and those that are around me are, you know, of the faith, believing and strong and encouraging me at all times, because sometimes I need encouragement, but yes, I have <laughs> some chapters outlined and I've started some chapters. It will be finished. I don't know when, but yes, a book is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. And just while we were talking, got some more love from everybody in the chat. Well said, Erica, for president of the U.S., we would definitely vote for you. Um, and that, that was from Adam Gobin and then James. I appreciate your transparency to help others with your story. Great inspiration. You know, the, the part about being vulnerable is hard for people. And I think as you are, are doing and have done, you lead by example. You show and, and even in the parts where you, that are difficult, you share that. And that inspires others to do the same. Um, as this is a time for, um, you know, it's giving, it's a giving time. Uh, wanted to talk with you about what your thoughts are on how we might be able to, to encompass that for College of Public Health, for Georgia, um, and, and a Giving Tuesday. Uh, what are your thoughts there, Erica? It's so funny. A student called me yesterday as I was preparing my responses <laughs> for my questions. I am all for giving. You know, um, giving is something that the university needs. I know a lot of people on here 
that are from other colleges and they always challenge me and say, well, why does Georgia need money? We always see them getting big checks in the news. Yes, that is true, but it trickles down to different areas. And so I'm gonna speak specifically to my school, the College of Public Health. If you want to help our students really thrive and really move forward in their careers, if you want to help them overcome some of the health disparities that they have experienced are currently experiencing, you should give to this college. This college was small. It was uh, developed in 2005 and we're young, but our heart is in the right place. Our heart is for our students. We have an awesome dean. I can say that because when I was a student, she was my program evaluation professor. And I will never forget my niece, who is now 11, was a preemie. My family was getting ready to have a preemie grandbaby. My baby sister was pregnant. And it was so emotional and so overwhelming. Here I am coming into Georgia, commuting from Cobb County. So picture that story about two hours one way, travel. And all these things are going on, all these papers are due. And here I have Professor, who is now the Dean that is just providing so much emotional support. We're talking about an academia. That's a different experience. I've been to several colleges and I've had opposite experiences. So to experience that here, to be at a college that practice what they preach about public health and helping and making sure our students are whole and getting the things that they need. She is very open and receptive of anything that we, provide as opportunities that we see could be opportunities for our students. And so I challenge you today to give $25 at the minimum. You want to give more, give more. And I challenge you to give that to the Stuart and Renee Feldman Health Disparities Award. Let me tell you a little bit about this. So at this moment, I'm going to read to you because I want to make sure that you understand the impact that is made when you give that money tonight because you're gonna give it, right? Yes. The purpose of the fund is to provide students, faculty and staff in the College of Public Health the opportunity to develop a greater understanding of health disparities and the outcomes faced by undeserved and disadvantaged populations to disseminate information about these health disparities and to develop and participate and activities designed to address the problem of health disparities for these populations. So I hope you got that. We're not just awarding the money to faculty and students, but it also is backed up with activities that give them the application to be excellent professionals in their future careers and to help our faculties thrive even more and to help our students to internships, research assistantships, graduate student assistantships, all those great things. That is why tonight I'm challenging you to give to this fund for the College of Public Health. Thank you so much, Erica. And on the chat in the Zoom, you'll see that uh, Lindsay did provide the link. So for those, um, if you can click on that, that's the link to be able to give one question I, I did want to have a follow-up on that one Erica on veterans is there is there I know we've been speaking of college public health and how important and critical that is uh, is there any way uh, that we can follow up and discuss uh, areas in, in how we can help veterans and how we might be able to give back to that community as well since I know that that is close to your heart as well Yes, Camouflage Me Not for the first time had a 30-day challenge that we created. Every day, there were simple acts of kindness that you can do for our veterans. I challenge you to go visit our website at www.camouflagemenot.com. That's www.camouflagemenot.com. Review that 30-day challenge. There's so many things that you can do. November is over, but every day you have an opportunity to write a veteran a note, send them a text, call them to check on them. But we volunteer all the time. There are 2.52 million veteran-owned organizations. Why not your next time you consider volunteering that you volunteer there? And why not work with Camouflage Me Not in a volunteer role? We would love to have you to help us shape our initiatives even more and to share with us ideas from things that you see 
because we know that you may have family members, friends, et cetera, coworkers, and you see different things. We want a, a great uh, approach that includes a diverse group of people coming together to make sure that our veterans and their family members thrive. Those are ways that you can continue to support us every day in simple ways as we continue to work together in the community. Fantastic, guys, you guys have homework. Everyone's listening, right? We've got simple acts of kindness, camouflage. Oh, you, I know she mentioned the, uh, hopefully, Lindsay, if you can put that in the, in the chat as well. Um, you know, and also um, one, one follow-up question, uh, or one final question, unless we've got more from, from the audience here. Um, Erica, what, if you had one word to sum you up, in your journey, what would that be and, and why? And what, what keeps you going? Cause you're, you really are, you inspire all of us. You make us better to be honest um, as, as, as people, as part of the board member and, and um, fellow health um, public health professionals. So what, what would you say sums you up in, in one word? Resilience. The army taught me to be resilient. I'm always to take anything I do serious because someone's life could be on the line. No matter how simple the task may seem to you, we are trained that my battle buddy could be in danger. And if I don't do my part, I could be an enemy. And so we're taught that you continue, you don't quit. If it didn't work that way, you pivot, you flip it, you study it, you study your terrain. That's what we call the environment. And that is basically how I'm able to thrive. I study my environment, no matter what communities I'm a part of, and I'm a part of many. I study people, I study the community, and I'm looking for how can I get you to work? How can I engage you more? Where are your sweet spots? That's what I'm looking at in anything that I do and say yes to. Because when I say yes to work with you, to mentor you, to be your team member, I'm going all in. And I expect you to do the same. Who, who here feels totally inspired and ready to go? <laughs> you're, you're the person I think we need to have, Erica, to pump us up before, our, you know, whatever the, the occasion is. I just want to thank you so much, Erica. I know we do have uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, I don't see any other questions, but I will open it up to the floor here. If there's any questions, you can speak directly, obviously, to Erica um, in our final few minutes here today uh, together. Oh, Meredith, let me... Uh before the time elapses, uh, I want to thank you and thank everyone for allowing me to be part of this. Uh, it's, it's, Erica has a great story, a really important story, and I think it's the kind of story that uh, we do need to tell uh, the world about what's happening from the alumni of the, uh, the College of Public Health. So I want to thank Erica. I want to thank you all for, uh, for allowing me to be part of it. The other thing is, uh, because there was a a commercial made for uh, contributing to uh, the Stuart Renee Feldman Fund. Uh, that's an interesting story because uh, when, when I got involved with the College of Public Health, and it really happened when uh, the university was looking for how do we become more competitive in research when we don't have a medical school? And uh, the provost at the time, because I had stepped down as the pharmacy dean, uh, put me in charge. One of the things that came out, and the chair of that working group was Phil Williams, who was the founding dean of the college. And we, we went around learning about public health, what it takes to put together, uh, and really led to the formation of the college. Uh, but part of it had to do with uh, me asking Phil, you know, what can I do to help? And of course, Phil, sort of a capitalist, uh, said, well, why don't you set up a fund? And it basically, it was, you know, what are you interested in doing and helping with? And that led to the formation of that fund, which uh, I think um, not so much from the formation, but the fact that it does support very important things, uh, not only for the college, but for the university as well. Uh, one of the things that struck me uh, as pharmacy dean when, when I became dean is the fact the low numbers of minority students at UGA, uh, the incredible 
small numbers of African-American students in a state that's 30% African-American. And that led to a fair number of things of what could we do about it, and it's still a trust, still a struggle. So I think uh, anything that can be done to support uh, creating an atmosphere for minority students to want to come to UGA and be happy here, which is another story and another question for another event, uh, is the fact that uh, this is 2021. And what we're seeing today is an unbelievable rise in racism, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, in a country that many thought was in the past. And I think, again, it's up to each of us to do what we can to, to work on reducing that. But again, I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of this. And Dr. Feldman, you, um, you, your life, all that you've done, you've definitely inspired all of us. And as you stated, I think a simple question that we all can say every day and to repeat what you just said is, what can I do to help? Right. And exactly what you said, Eric and I met last night in preparation for today. And we talked about all the strides that were made in our in our history and, and where, you know, and I would talk to Lindsay as well. And it often feels like we've gone backwards and it shouldn't be that way. Right. So and, and to your point, uh, we're at a time that we should be coming together and um, honoring honoring each other. Um, you know, uh, every day and, and not having more divide, but more unity. So thank you for your time, uh, Dr. Feldman, and for being here and being an amazing moderator uh, and for all your um, crucial questions that you asked. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate your time very much. Erica, is there, you know, last few words here, uh, anything else you'd like to state before we close? You've been, done an excellent job. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Feldman to being the moderator. It's a perfect match. We need to do this more often <laughs> to have you and others come and be a part of the Black Alumni Connection Series. For those of you all that are here for the first time, I want to just share with you all how this started, especially after Dr. Feldman gave his, his talk on, you know, where he seen this country be, and we're kind of sort of in that same situation in so many areas. So the Black Alumni Connection Series was launched National Public Health Week, which is the second week in April. We uh, launched the Black Alumni Connection Series as a part to commemorate the 60th year of desegregation at the University of Georgia. And so just moving forward, it may take on different faces, but we want to encourage you, because some of you have young youth, have, have youth, uh, young kids that are thinking about college. We want you to think about the UGA experience, especially if you have kids that are minorities. We want you to think about having your kids to come here. We want you to really marinate on the things that we talked about tonight and what that experience could look like for you and your family and the resources that are here beyond academia, as I shared my story, about Dean Davis when she was a professor. We want you to know that your students are safe here and we want you to know that they can thrive here and go on and do greater things. We are a serious bulldog nation. We are global. And even when I lived in Columbia, South Carolina, I was attached to the South Carolina chapter and there is never a bulldog barking alone. I just wanna thank you tonight for coming being of support, however you were led here. I appreciate you taking out your time and I hope you have a great evening and continue to be safe. God bless. Thank you, Erica. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you everyone for your time, Dr. Feldman uh, and everybody that has attended. And um, again, as we, as we leave here, please note that, um, you know, our, our mission uh, is critical every day. We need to continue to be part of the solution. And um, we appreciate uh, these amazing leaders on the phone talking to us and inspiring us. So let's do our part. Those, um, if you can, I know Lori's already donated. So thank you for doing that, Lori. 